morning, everybody. Um, I, one failure that I did here was design these slides on a small laptop. So you're going to see a huge font here today. <laughs> Um, but anyway, I just wanted to say good morning, and also it's my first time here in Ireland. Um, and as I was landing, I just thought, oh my gosh, this place is just so green. Um, coming from the sort of concrete jungle uh, that I was in, it, it's, it's just a lovely place. So thank you for inviting me here. Um, and I'm just really happy to be here today. I'm also really happy to be following you know, Lou and this amazing panel. So you can already see here in Ireland the, the catalyzers um, here in government. So it's really lovely to see service design already moving here, uh, here in Ireland. Um, so just to give you a quick intro, so I'm Mari Nakano, I'm the former design director of the service design studio of, um, here uh, that was sitting in the New York City Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity. I've been a design and system strategist for about 15 years now, building design teams and pushing um, the growth of service design and participatory practices um, in these kind of big, fun, uh, bureaucratic environments uh, like NYC and UNICEF. And I'll share with you today um, a little bit about how service design was able to grow in New York City um, and the impact and influence it's had on the city. Um, but oops. But I first wanted to sort of start off with this question to you also. If you could take your government hats and reading glasses off for a second and think about just yourself as an everyday, um, you know, a resident here of just imagine, you know, what kind of Ireland do you envision? What does, what does it feel like? What does it look like? Uh, what might it smell like? Um, hopefully good smells. Um, what kind of energy, what kind of vibe? And, and if you feel compelled to shout out a word or phrase right now, feel, feel free to go ahead. Anyone? Creative. Creative, love that. Maybe you're thinking about the greenery of this space like I am. Positive, perhaps a place where you can imagine um, more inclusivity, more safety, you know, things like that. Um, and I just kind of want to move on to say, look, let's think about this question now then. You can put your government hats back on and say, you know, what kind of government then with these visions and what kind of government might we envision for the people of Ireland? And as public servants and leaders, you know, how do we want to shape that? If we envision an Ireland that does these X, Y, Z visions that you have in your mind, how might we design a government that supports these visions to come to life? How might we transform not just what we de deliver and the quality in which we deliver those things, but also what kind of government culture or mindset or attitude uh, do we need to shape so that we can better enable good services, good service delivery, and ultimately stronger and more trusted relationships with the people of Ireland? So on your left here is this sort of pizza-shaped diagram. Um, that points downwards and represents sort of a traditional program development model that I think a lot of us are familiar with. So at the top of the triangle, you have those who administer the services. Below that are those who develop services. Below that, those who deliver. But at the point at the bottom are the communities. Uh, we like to call them communities, which is a term inclusive of citizens, residents, the undocumented NGO service providers, frontline staff, customers, users, um, kind of keeping to the, to the theme of kind of New York foods and everything, you kind of move over here to your right, this sort of bagel-shaped um, diagram. Um, and uh, here, you know, we, we are trying to, this is a service design approach uh, where we're really moving away from sort of top-down traditional modes of operating towards a government that we can better uh, collaborate with um, communities and all stakeholders to improve and implement successful and sustainable services. I'm going to give you a little bit of context around the service design studio and then um, New York City just in general. Um, but the studio sits inside the mayor's office for economic opportunity, where our mission is to use evidence and innovation to reduce poverty and increase equity. Driven by this mission, the studio helps further 
<clears throat> the city's use of service design, partnering with agencies and other offices to engage with residents and those who deliver services so that their voices and insights can shape new and existing programs. Um, because we sit at a mayoral level, we are able to both support other mayoral offices and move across um, various agencies and offices. Um, we are also in closer proximity and are more visible to senior leaders um, like our deputy mayors, um, our commissioners who report directly to the mayor. Uh, we officially launched in 2017, starting off with building a sort of proof of concept version of ourselves in late 2015 to early 2017 via the leadership of the then product and design director, Ariel Kennan. And I'll show you some examples in a second of our initial years. Well, a little bit more context here is so. Here on the left side, you see uh, this giant bubble here of 8.7 million New Yorkers. And then this kind of middle-sized bubble here in the middle is uh, the 325,000 New York City public servants who uh, thrive in 125 different uh, agencies and offices in New York. And on the farthest right, you see the service design studio, who is the teeniest bubble of four to six uh, staff at a time. Um, while there are a growing number of service uh, designers across New York City, um, the difference is that our team is the only one right now that's able to support across agencies and offices. A lot of the other service design teams um, are sticking kind of within their agencies and offices uh, to support that specific work. Um, though, but I want to say though, though we do pack a punch as tiny as we are, um, that's not really an excuse for governments to uh, invest any less in service designers. Rather, if anything, I think we're showing that if scaled, uh, as, as you've uh, heard from Lou with the UK, um, just how much more powerful government can be. So let's talk about a little bit about how we did this. Uh, why we did this, uh, how did we do it, and what has been the impact so far. So why did we do, why did we have a service design studio? So reason number one, to join in the effort to, to tackle this very wicked problem of poverty, which is very prevalent here in New York, in, in New York City. So on that slide, um, on this slide is a, a donut, all these food puns today, pie chart of um, showing that the, of the 8.7 million uh, New York residents, of them, 17.9% of them live in poverty, and for another 40.8% live in near poverty, which is basically a paycheck or two away uh, from the poverty line. So that kind of adds up a little bit to nearly a little bit over half of New Yorkers. Um, as a team who has a mission to alleviate poverty in New York City, we have our work cut out for us. And so we knew it was not enough to go about um, operating business as usual. And there's a big need for innovation to contribute to this space and service design is an approach that can address multiple policy areas and sort through and streamline complicated systems. So if you kind of think about taking out that wad of Christmas lights, um, you know, around Christmas time, service design is kind of the approach that kind of untangles them. So reason number two, it's economical, it's efficient, and it can save tax dollars. So on this slide is an image of a report cover called the Total Economic Impact of IBM's Design Thinking Practice. And beside it are the words cut costs, reduce risks, increase in efficiency, and increase profitability. Uh, while this is not an evaluation of the service design studio in New York, we learn um, we, we lean on the evidence such as this to understand the potential um, serving uh, savings and efficiency impacts for the city. So IBM's thinking, um, whose scale is maybe more akin to the number of folks uh, in the UK, has doubled design and executing speed. It's slashed time for design and alignment by about 75%. It's reduced uh, development and testing time by 33%, cut design defects in half, increased portfolio profitability, and it has reduced costs by 9.2 million in streamlined processes. Um, but you've heard also the kind of government numbers that were shared by um, Lou too, and you can probably pull her aside around lunch to ask more about that. So on this slide is a very blurry image of the New York City organizational chart with the mayor there where that little uh, kind of gold seal is. We're, we're here in the orange section here, but you see that there's something at the top, might be a bit fuzzy to read, so I'll zoom in here. 
What's at the top of our org chart is the people of the city of New York. Um, and so reason three, if the people of New York City are at the top of our org chart, then what that is reminding us is who we are designing for. So if design and government is about putting people at the center, then well then I think service design is a fitting approach as its core is about putting people first. So on, the top of all, on top of kind of all of the things I was uh, sharing, it's really understood that being embedded, an embedded team was advantageous in that we were able to invest in our relationships with colleagues, which meant we could build internal trust in ways that a contracted vendor, for example, might not be able to. And being embedded also meant we could shift more uh, quickly to address new mayoral priorities and align faster with internal and uh, external stakeholders. So um, those were some of the whys, but let's talk about kind of how we did this. So again, in our initial years around 2016, 2017, we focused first on demonstrating a sort of proof of concept version of ourselves by making big impacts that were easy to measure and tangible for our sort of onlookers. On this slide is an image of Access NYC's front page on mobile phone, tablet, uh, desktop, and, and a little bit there on the laptop. Access NYC is a modern platform that allows New Yorkers to go through about to go through a 10-step simple process um, available in 11 languages to determine eligibility for about 50 state, um, local, and federal level public benefits. Um, after our design product and tech teams redesigned and replatformed Access NYC, whose data and code are all open source and available online, uh, we saw the average number of monthly users jump from 5,000 to 8,800 on average, um, with a screener comple completion rate going from originally 20% to 60% on 67% uh, on average per month. Around the same time um, that we were doing Access NYC, uh, we, we took on another hefty project with the Department of Homeless Services, or DHS, to develop the first known journey map um, from street homelessness to housing. So on this slide are two images, one of the journey map showing a bunch of dots, which represent the various stakeholders that were involved uh, from end to end. And the other image is of a plain cover of the New York City. It's a 250-page report that breaks down this journey map bit by bit. It's called the Stake, uh, Stakeholder Research Insights Report, documenting the journey from uh, street to home, January through May of 2016. Um, and you know, the insights that were generated from this mapping and research that our team had done uh, influenced a 103% increase in the number of street outreach workers that there were. Um, it expanded case management services and outreach supports um, and resources. And uh, there was a creation of new transparency metrics that were publicly available, and they're still publicly available on the Homestat website, um, as well as a project agreement uh, based on a citywide data integration legal framework to govern how the data about people experiencing homelessness can be shared across agencies. And so in fiscal year 2017, Homestat then was able to place 2,146 clients into permanent housing, transitional housing, and other stabilization settings. And Homestat to this day remains one of the most comprehensive outreach initiatives for street homelessness in any uh, US uh, national city. So in addition to some of these sort of founding projects, I wanted to kind of share with you a little bit more about how we developed a suite of services to socialize service design across New York City and bring people together across government to exchange ideas and get support. So on this slide are images of the tools and tactics workbook, binder, website, and field guide that we passed out to just about any uh, public servant that we cross paths with. And on this next slide is a collage of photos of public servants who came to our weekly office hours where we offer one-on-one -on -one sessions to troubleshoot and strategize design questions with various agencies. We've been told many times, actually it's funny but so needed, um, that these sessions are like therapy sessions, <laughs> especially for staff who have been sort of lone rangers trying to apply service design um, in, their kind of, in their work settings. Um, and, and sort of, I just want to point out that that's something like really interesting to us. These are public servants across government, and I'm sure there are, there are public servants just like that here in uh, Ireland too, 
who really, truly to desire to practice and apply service design. They have a mission-driven willpower and passion, but what they need are the resources and capacity to execute. Um, so, and a couple more things, you know, same, same the way the, the UK Gov did too. You know, we are, we, we have an image here of, ha you know, hands interacting with uh, sh worksheets and post-it notes here on the right side or your right, your left side. And then on the right side, um, a scene of uh, uh, public servants taking one of our service design trainings. And then here, our kind of last offering is our bi-monthly civic design forums where we gather anywhere between 50 to 75 uh, civil servants at a time from across agencies to practice service design and product design methods um, and share really various innovative projects that are happening uh, in other corners of the city. And so on this, um, so on this slide is really an image of a crowd of public servants sitting around tables and listening to a talk um, about how we envision co-design in government. So aside from doing kind of actual projects, you can see we took the time to set up an ecosystem of sort of light, medium, and deeper opportunities for people to skill up and apply service design in their work. Our consultation and recommendations were seen as trusted best practice approaches, which really helped, especially for those lone rangers that I was talking about, um, who could take that information and advocate up to their bosses to try service design approaches. Um, you can see some quotes here from various uh, uh, kind of design champs, as we like to call them, in the city. Shiko Mittal from the Department of uh, Small Business has said, I think service design offers an approach in which we can go out and talk to people with the goal of developing insights that will help us serve people better. If people feel heard, they'll feel included and more invested in continuing to be part of the conversation with the public sector. And then Grant Pazeski from the Department of Health and Mental Health, there's an incredible array of design patterns, uh, pattern resources available online from city and even federal resources. Uh, you can start small by integrating it into your work little by little. And there's a generous community of practice growing in city government right now. Demi Canty from the Administration of Children's Services, I'm lucky enough to have leaders within the Division of Prevention and Community-Based Strategies that not only support integrating service design into our work, but are also striving to make it a standard practice for how ACS supports families. And lastly, Sam Glazer Nolan from the Mayor's Office of Operations. After seeing how service design tools and tactics helped us understand the complexities of homelessness and service delivery, I realized how important it was to incorporate them into our daily work. All of these efforts are enabled because we had leaders like yourselves actually supporting, advocating, and participating in service design efforts. Our executive director, deputy mayors, various commissioners were all to credit for making way for service design to integrate itself into the work and into government culture. And I think I'd like to say too, you know, you folks here in the room have the power to make this happen here in Ireland. And it starts with giving permission to yourselves and to your teams. It lives and thrives in New York City, in the UK, um, all in various countries around the world already. So you're definitely not starting um, from nothing. And there is a growing strong global practice that is here and ready to uplift Ireland too. So I already brought up examples of whys and hows, but I'll start kind of winding down and taking you quickly through some of our more uh, latest impacts. So in 2019, uh, we worked closely with the Administration for Children's Services to develop new and improved ideas for connecting families to strength-based prevention services, which are services that essentially help mitigate children from being separated from their families and caretakers and placed into foster care. So most significantly, what we did was help inform a $2 billion multi-year request for proposal to re-procure child welfare contracts affecting 20,000 families, 44,000 children, and 200 child welfare programs. And that team is still applying service design today in their work, uh, calling us sometimes for a little bit of support. Um, and what's really lovely to know is that after all of this, um, it really ignited them to actually hire a service designer onto their team. We are also underway, uh, oops, I skipped one. 
Did I? Yes. We are underway working closely with the Human Resources Administration and the Department of Social Services to stand up the first social service innovation center uh, for incubating new ideas for improving public services and starting off with small service design pilots and training, uh, staff training and exploring ways to strengthen and scale up the DSS staff who can take the lead to further this vision. Um, and lastly, kind of catalyzed by the pandemic, we also started a community-based fellowship and funding program to co-design with local NGOs, a framing uh, this funding program for community leaders to leverage service design to implement new ideas in the community. So this year, the studio, uh, through a roughly kind of, uh, I believe, $110,000 grant, will be supporting a Bronx-based NGO and local community leaders to develop, to develop digital access uh, programming and supports for a new maker space. Um, and with that, we also have a commitment in the following years to double down on the amount that we are putting into this program. More recently, we've been selected by the Center for Urban Futures as one of 150 ideas for making New York City more equitable. So literally, it was suggested to scale up the service design studio and hire service designers across city agencies. And another potential impact um, that we may that may happen actually very soon uh, is in the de is the development of a citywide access design program. So the studio influenced the proposal of this program under a new racial equity office plan and commission, which is on our November general election ballot. Um, if the public votes this November, a new program meant to set citywide accessibility standards and bolster the scaling of service design will be formed. Zooming out on a national level, the Biden administration in the end of 2021 put out an executive order on transforming federal customer experience and service delivery to rebuild trust in government. And so one of the strategies in includes improving the service design, digital products, and customer experience management of federal high impact service providers by reducing customer burden, addressing inequities and streamlining processes. And it's, only, it's in the last one or two months or so prior to departing my role that where we started to see this customer experience plan trickle down into New York City. And so you, now you will see agencies and offices making their own customer experience commitments that will roll back up to this one. Uh, I know this is probably really daunting, but uh, and I don't have a lot of time up here. Um, but I just wanted to kind of show another, you know, other areas the studio has actually supported New York City. So from emergency disasters, COVID, early childhood uh, education, um, civic engagement, uh, public benefits access, um, all of these things are touch points that we've had touch points with all of these uh, different policy areas. Um, so I know I gave you a lot, um, but I, what I hope is that none of this was daunting um, and that, it was, that I was able to share with you sort of a variety of examples that show you that yes, this is possible, this is being done. You've heard stories now from folks here, from folks abroad about what service design can do. Um, and if you're wondering you know, how you might get started, perhaps one thing is to think about as you look at the principles that will be revealed today, there are some action examples of how you might be able to apply some of those principles. So I uh, ask maybe for you to make that commitment to perhaps think about what can you do in the next one or two weeks or so uh, to apply those principles in your work. Um, so, you know, to end with this, I'd like to say, you know, my title of this, uh, sp this talk was about being service design being more than a, a nice to have, but really what actually I came here to say is it's a must to have. Uh, it's a must have. Um, so really with that, I will end the talk, um, but thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so, 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 so.